Hi. Well, we're getting down to the end of the day. <laughs> I was asked to speak here as uh, a clergy person, a person of faith, but actually I began my organizing career in Baltimore. And I was an organizer for 17 years before I went to seminary, and I've been a minister for 16. So you can see how the intersection of organizing and ministry is right here in me. And it's been great to uh, hear the stories today. Um, <clears throat> on Tuesday at the Supreme Court, the rally uh, pro-marriage equality was led not by a GLBT organization, but the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights, which encompasses 200 organizations of many different kinds, including Latino, African American, religious, you name it, labor, everybody was there. Everybody was represented amongst the speakers. And I, I thought it was a great example of the kaleidoscope of, of Americans and of the intersectionality and switch points that we would be talking about today. One of the speakers was uh, Baltimore Raven linebacker, Brendan Ayambadejo, mm -hmm. who told the rally attendees how they won the Super Bowl. He said it was because of love. And I thought of that <coughs> when you were speaking last night, uh, talking about the importance of love for grounding the relationships that make it possible for us to do this kind of work long haul. He said that the uh, the uh, Ravens love each other more than the Patriots love each other. <laughs> he said that we know each other. In the locker rooms and in travel, we talk to each other. We talk about the little stuff that happens in our lives and the big stuff. We talk about our wives and our children. And then he paused and he said, someday the guy next to me is going to tell me about his husband and his kids. So it was a great, a great moment of uh, intersectionality with a sports figure. Who would have thought? <laughs> so love is really the language of faith, not organizing. But like you said last night, Andrea, it does, it sustains our work, and it's in the relationships that you all have built. And I think that exciting things happen because sharing across boundaries our stories helps people be willing to take risks, join forces, and helps us talk less about rights, which can be divisive, and more about caring and connection and, of course, equality. So when people make a caring or loving connection, it opens them up to listen, to hear, and to be changed. In my own congregation, our Unitarian Universalism has been active in GLBT rights for decades and decades, but that doesn't mean that every individual who enters our doors is open. And uh, just a few weeks ago, we had someone sharing a testimonial as to how being in the church had changed him and was why he was pledging. We have an annual pledge drive just like NPR, or PBS, and so he was telling why. And he told about how he never considered himself homophobic, but getting to know some gay people in the congregation opened his eyes, helped him understand why civil unions weren't good enough. He is an African-American man, late 30s, early 40s, then he explained that once we got involved in the marriage equality campaign and came along to election day, he was asked to work at the polls. Well, he had never, ever done anything political, and he certainly had never worked at a polling place distributing literature for marriage equality, but because he was asked by somebody else in the <coughs> congregation, he couldn't not do it. So he did, and he had a fantastic time. And he went, at the end of the day, into the polling location to find out what the count was for his spot. He was at, um, in Greenbelt, Maryland, and it passed in that <laughs> precinct. And he was just so pumped. And so I tell that story because I think that, you know, we think about coalition work to, to change the world, but it changes individuals and I, I think that's such an important part of why religious organizations ought to be involved. 
In the Campaign for Marriage Equality, the uh, coalition, Marylanders for Marriage Equality, put out the message after the law passed that we are going to, you know, have this big referendum battle leading up to November 6th on question six, and what it was going to take was conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Now, of course, the governor, and I give him a lot of credit, raised a lot of money, and so did the Human Rights Campaign, and they brought in tons of really wonderful staff people on the field and in their PR department. But I think a lot happened because people got oriented to telling stories one-on-one. -on -one. My congregation is 200 members and maybe another 100 friends. We had two trainings on how to have these conversations. 30 people came to the first and 20 to the second. If you figure that each of those people, 50 people, had 10 conversations with somebody who was undecided and maybe convinced half of them, that's a lot of yes votes right there. And so on top of the ads, which really targeted African-American voters in Maryland because that's such an important population in our state, we had this whole effort going on led by different kinds of faith communities to have one-on-one -on -one con congregations, conversations. And then they, um, the, the Casa de Maryland proposed to Equality Maryland, one of the members of the coalition, that there be some joint work. This turned out to be great for my congregation. We were there, we've been there on GLBT stuff, as I mentioned, but we're largely white, 10% people of color, one Latino out of 200 members. So we weren't up on immigration issues, and we didn't have any dreamers in our congregation. So we had to get educated, and by the two coalitions coming together, that gave us uh, more momentum, and we had uh, Casa de Maryland came with some of their youth and talked in our church, not you, but somebody, <laughs> <laughs> and um, people got educated, and then they were willing to work for it, and turned out for the rally that you had at that church, I forget where it was, and um, so I think that that when coalitions work together <coughs> across so-called boundaries, then it makes it easier for individuals and uh, smaller networks to get together. I gave a little bit thought to how these bonds that got created by question six and question four movements coming together might benefit the domestic workers um, movement. And I think that most religious organizations that would tend to want to get involved have organizations like you do. We have UUs for social justice, UUSJ. You've got what well, you've got. Many of the denominations do, and I think that's a great place to start linkages because those groups have ways of reaching the clergy and lay leaders in their own settings. Um, and it always helps to have a few clergy. I don't know if you found that to be true, but <clears throat> when it's only lay leaders, you know, it's like who has power? The clergy need to get involved. Um, so I think that's really all I wanted to say. I tried to talk fast. <laughs>